Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday, January 20th. I'm Kate Andrews, the Spectator's Economics Editor and your host this week. On this week's show, Redwall Tory MPs turned on Boris Johnson. With the Sue Gray report now due next week, can his premiership survive? Katie Balls and James Forsyth will join me. We know what the Prime Minister's critics think, but what about his supporters? How can they still say he's up to the job? I'll speak to Tory MP Marcus Fish. Douglas Murray says in this week's magazine that there's little to show for the 11 years of Conservative rule. Johnson's attempts to woo voters with populist policies just won't cut it, he says. He'll be on to explain. Then we'll turn to COVID. It looks like Omicron has hit its peak, but we'll dig into the details with Michael Simmons, the Spectator's data journalist, who will run us through the latest numbers. Then I'll speak to Dr. Ellen Brooks Pollock. She sits on the Spy M Group and will talk to us about the modeling process. Finally, in his column this week, Rory Sutherland says drinking in the office really isn't so bad. He'll tell us why. Before we get going, if you enjoy Spectator TV, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the red subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. And why not subscribe to The Spectator's Magazine, too? You can get 12 weeks of the magazine in print and online, along with a £20 Amazon voucher for just £12. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer to take it up. Yesterday, it seemed like Boris Johnson might be facing a no-confidence vote imminently. His Red Wall MPs, that's those representing seats that were previously Labour strongholds, turned on him after weeks of revelations about Downing Street parties during lockdown. But might the PM be safe, for now anyway? I'm joined by Katie Balls, who wrote this week's cover piece, and our political editor, James Forsyth. Katie, in this week's cover piece, you write about how red walled Tory MPs have turned on the Prime Minister. Can you briefly run us through what's happened the past few days? Yes, so I think there was an expectation that this week would be almost a quiet week in between the drama of last week when there were uh, new revelations about Boris Johnson and Partygate, his admission that he attended a Downing Street party, and now that wait to the Sue Gray report into parties. But there was quite a lot of panic on Tuesday amongst the whips in 10 Downing Street, and because they suddenly got word that lots of letters could be going in and actually a confidence vote could happen this week. Now, the reason they thought they weren't going to hit 54 this week was that ultimately it was, it was mainly long-time Boris Johnson critics, a handful of perhaps um, Scottish Tories, and therefore they thought that the main bulk of the party is not going to move until they see the report. But actually the 2019 intake, um, many of whom are red wall um, seats in terms of their, their constituencies, they had got together in what's been dubbed the pork pie plot, owing to um, the host of the meeting, or one of, one of those involved, um, perhaps it's fair to say, um, has a seat which is linked to pork pies, not also a red wall seat. It's quite a weak joke, but um, the reason it's important was around 20 of these MPs met up. They had a secret ballot to see how many had already put their letters in. That was about half, and more planned to do so. Um, that led to retaliation by the Whip's office, by the government, um, and really uh, a defection eventually of one Tory MP to Labour. What's interesting is the reason we're not talking on a day of confidence vote is I think that defection of, by Christian Wakeford has calmed things down slightly. But if you step away from this, what you have is a situation where the very MPs that Boris Johnson um, once you know, saw as the future of his premiership, those red wall seats that he staked so much on, um, are the ones that are actually now turning against him and really leading the fight to oust him from 10 Downing Street. And James, how is the Prime Minister standing today? To pick up on a point that Katie just made that you yourself have also written about, he's in a strangely better place now, isn't he? That there's been this defection of a Red Wall MP, Christian Wakeford. So the, the defection stopped the plotting because it, it, it got the Tories' tribal um, sense going again. Uh, they were rowdier in support of Boris Johnson at PMQs than they have been recently, where they've been conspicuously quiet. Uh, but I think that was largely because they were shouting at Christian Wakeford, who had, uh, who had left their benches to go and sit behind Keir Starmer uh, on the Labour side. I, I think what Christian Wakeford has done is he means that Tory MPs are now reversing to what was plan A, which was to wait for the Sue Gray report to come out uh, and then send their letters in. I think there are a chunk of Tory MPs, quite large in number, probably not large enough on their own, to tip it over the 54 mark. 
who are prepared to, uh, who have essentially made up their mind to send a letter in as soon as the Grey report comes out, almost regardless of what it says. One of them said to me, you know, that's the right thing to do because, you know, you must have due process, not mob justice. So, I mean, the Prime Minister's, the moment of vulnerability for the Prime Minister now is when this Grey report comes out. There is intense speculation in Whitehall about uh, how bad it is going to be for the Prime Minister. Downing Street have been very confident that it, that, it, that, it was, that it was going to be something from which they could launch a fight back. And I think Sue Gray is a sole servant. She's not going to want to write, and it's not her remit to write a report that brings down the Prime Minister. But I think this delay in the report coming out uh, it was, you know, Downing Street were expecting it towards the end of this week. It's now not coming out until next week. I don't think that is an encouraging sign for them. Katie, why is it that 2019 MPs and Redwall MPs in particular are turning on the Prime Minister? So I think there's a few factors. I think the most obvious is just small majorities. You have a situation where lots of those seats, particularly in the Red Wall, so the Midlands and North, um, are, you know, a couple of hundred, Christian Wakeford, who defected, his um, majority was, you know, just under 400, around 400. And therefore, I think when these MPs start to look at the polls, um, you know, some polls putting Labour uh, 11 points ahead, um, they start to get very nervous. They don't think they have the luxury of some of these MPs in more traditional Tory seats to wait and see how things happen. And they're also fairly new, obviously. Um, they've only been in Parliament for you know a handful of years now, about two years. So when they get that voter backlash, um, they have less to compare it to. Um, that said, lots of people say the voter backlash on this is bad. Um, but there was a poll um, just this week um, which came out which said, you know, in the Red Wall on current polling, where an election held tomorrow, they would lose all but a handful of seats. So just keep a, a very small number that you count on one hand. And I think that is clearly um, making people very nervous. You all also have a situation where I think these MPs are much more independent, partly because many of them did not actually expect to be elected in 2019. Um, and for that reason, you didn't really see um, CCHQ putting in their favourite candidates in some of these places. Um, you know, the traditional route of former specialist advisor turned MP and um, they're much more likely to be local activists and I think as one um, whip put to me when they're trying to explain how this flock is quite tricky for them is um, they said in their view that lots of these MPs are not Tories they are Brexiteers who ran for the Conservative Party um, and that means that there is less of a, a probably a patience with you know sticking with um, what's good for the, the Tory brand in, in that sense. James, you write in the magazine this week that Tory MPs want to see major changes in Downing Street. And you mentioned that a number 10 plan is to try to bring back Linton Crosby, the famed campaigner who won David Cameron his majority in 2015 and has also worked with Boris Johnson in the past. Would that be enough, a change at the very top, to make Tory MPs happy? Or are they going to want to see more? I think the presence of Linton Crosby would reassure a lot of Tory MPs. Um, one cabinet minister who's kind of loyal to Boris Johnson likened uh, him to Boris Johnson to a kind of a, a bright but disorganised pupil who needs a kind of tutor to kind of stand over him and make sure he does his homework and get him through his exams. And they see Linton Crosby as, as, as that kind of figure. I mean, they also think that Linton Crosby would kind of, you know, to use one of his phrases, get the barnacles off the boat, um, get uh, and also put an end to this situation where Boris Johnson's attitude to his advisers has always been a bit like British foreign policy towards Europe in the 19th century. He wants to maintain a balance of power among them so that no one faction is is dominant. And he likes that because that means that, you know, he is ultimately the casting vote and everyone has to look to him for, for a decision. And I think Tory MPs want an end to those competing agendas. And they think that Linton Crosby would not, and I think they're right in this, would not come into Downing Street unless he had that kind of authority. So we know what Johnson's critics think, but what about his supporters? How do they defend the Prime Minister's actions? I was joined yesterday evening by Marcus Fish, a Conservative MP who is still backing the Prime Minister. Marcus, thanks so much for joining Spectator TV. So some of your colleagues have become more vocal in the past few days about their feelings about the Prime Minister, specifically that he needs to resign. Most of your colleagues have tried to remain silent on the matter, putting their heads down, not going one way or the other. But you're joining us today to give a robust defense of the Prime Minister. Uh, what would you say is your top line? I am a supporter of the Prime Minister. I don't want to in any way minimize uh, what may have happened or 
um, how pe pe people might feel about that. And I know it's irritating. It's irritated me. It's irritated. It's more than irritated a lot of people. Uh, but the fact is, the country has um, some really big challenges as we come out of the pandemic. And I certainly think that the Prime Minister uh, deserves our support trying to get his operation into a better state um, and one that is really fit for, those for addressing those challenges uh, that are so important to ordinary people's lives up and down the country. You talk about him needing to get operations in order, him needing to sort some things out. Is your support conditional, say, on reorganization of number 10, or an additional apology, or the Sue Gray report? Or is it unconditional, a, a pragmatic approach that you want certain policies achieved in the future, and you think he's the person to get them over the line? Everyone will be interested to see what the Sue Gray report um, says, and uh, to be um, uh, clear that, that any lessons that need to be learnt from that have been learnt um, and um, that you know, new, new structures, if they're needed, are implemented. I do think, going forward, we need to focus on a uh, sort of uh, conservative approach to uh, life after the pandemic. I think we need to focus on reforms that, that can uh, increase the supply of goods and services as a way of addressing the uh, cost of living pressures that are coming through. Um, and I do think that we need a new team around the Prime Minister to be able to uh, be credible in delivering that. You speak of a staff overhaul, but I think it will still concern people this idea that the Prime Minister needs multiple people around him, new people around him, to inform him of a simple fact, whether or not a party is going on in front of his own eyes. It doesn't speak very highly of his judgment if he needs a cohort of people to inform him whether or not the warm white wine, the food on the tables, the dozens of people around him socialising, classify as a party or not? I think we need to understand what the facts of the matter are, and that, that's the whole point of the Sue Gray report. So I would rather sort of wait and see what happens there. Um, I do think, you know, um, uh, no, no one is perfect, and um, no one's judgement is perfect all of the time. Um, but I do think um, that the Prime Minister is somebody who is able to communicate very well with people and I think we need to give him the chance to do that and to set out the path that he wants to uh, take us out of the pandemic on. Um, and I, I think most people in the country are probably going to be more focused on what the future holds for them rather than the particular details of something that happened um, coming up for two years ago in the height of a pandemic, which is thankfully um, receding into the past behind us, in part because of the, um, the very uh, good actions that the Prime Minister has championed along the way, whether it's on vaccines and getting that programme organised, uh, the unlocking programme, um, that means that our economy is in better shape now than almost any other economy in the world. And that gives us a good platform on which to build. I think people in the country would be, uh, would actually look pretty aghast at Tories fighting with each other uh, when we should be focused on the future. As you mentioned, this government hasn't seized on many of the opportunities of Brexit yet. And I know that you were also a, a strong opponent of the vaccine passport scheme, which ended up being ushered in under Boris Johnson, albeit now is going to be shelved when Plan B measures expire next week. Uh, you and your colleague David Davis have both, broadly speaking, been lined up on these issues. But of course, David Davis took a different perspective on the Prime Minister's future in the House of Commons today. Why is it that you have decided to split from that perspective and defend the Prime Minister when, as you point out yourself, he's actually disappointed you on quite a few fronts over the past few years since he's had the opportunity to make real change? Well, I, I, I do believe his heart is in the right place on that. Clearly, the pandemic has been a massive issue in terms of sucking all of the bandwidth out of government in a whole range of areas. Um, and now is an opportunity to, to set out that, uh, that um, conservative path to making use of our uh, 
freedoms and um, make, making use of it in a way um, that is beneficial to the people of this this country. And I think that a further distraction of you know um, uh, different candidates being championed by different people it would be a very messy situation for for many months. And actually, um, I think we are better off um, sticking with the the uh, with 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 the date who we came with, and sorting it out and sorting it out for people up and down the country. Uh, last question to you, Marcus. Uh, what would it take to convince you otherwise or change your mind? If the Prime Minister were found to have known about the party on the 20th of May, he has insisted that he had no prior knowledge that there was going to be a party taking place. Do you think then he should resign? I think we need to appreciate what the situation was at that time. He was only barely a few weeks out of hospital. Um, and I just simply don't, don't know what what emails he might have been seeing or, or not seeing or or, um, uh, what, or what he was being advised. But it is, it is conceivable that his judgment wasn't in tip-top shape at that point in time. And I think that most people thinking back to that time um, will appreciate that that was, um, that, that, that was a potentially um, difficult situation for him and everybody else. I'm not defending in any way the, um, I think, somewhat puerile behaviour of um, uh, what seems to be to have been going on in um, number 10 amongst some of the staff. And I think that they should have had more, more of a mind to what people were sacrificing around the country at that time. But would you agree that over the past few weeks, when the Prime Minister has been insisting to the House of Commons that he had no knowledge of parties taking place, that he has been in a sound state of mind while doing that? I would hope so, yeah, I would hope so. Marcus, thank you for joining Spectator TV. With Tory poll numbers collapsing, Number 10 has a grand plan to win voters back, and they're calling it Operation Red Meat, unveiling policies like freezing the BBC licence fee to try to get their supporters back on side. In this week's magazine, Douglas Murray says he's not being fooled. After 11 years of conservative rule, there's little to show for it. To discuss, he joins me on the show now. Douglas, as always, thank you for joining Spectator TV. You write in the magazine this week about Operation Red Meat, Boris Johnson's plan to save his premiership. Tell us what you make of it. Yes, Operation Red Meat is the report that the Prime Minister is going to try to overcome the travails that he has gone through in recent weeks by throwing his uh, voter base some red meat, uh, some uh, tough Tory policies uh, that will hopefully dampen any uh, leadership questions around him, dampen uh, all of the discontent and remind the great uh, Conservative voter base of why they need Boris Johnson more than ever. Um, I've been looking at a lot of these policies and they're around immigration, the BBC, as you say, real red meat for the base. Do you think it's working or do you think he's just reminding his core base of what he hasn't done for two and a half years? Yeah, that's, that's a very important point, exactly. See, as I say in the column, uh, my own view is that there's no reason why if you haven't done something from day one, you're suddenly going to start doing it in year three. Uh, and I think the Conservative voters now, as with previous Conservative governments, are right to be sceptical about this. Um, as you say, there, there's the BBC. What does it consist of so far? Nadine Dorries announcing this week that there will be a freeze on the licence fee. Uh, do you remember at the beginning of, of this uh, government, we had uh, talk of uh, Charles Moore, no less, our own colleague, uh, taking over as chairman of the BBC. Um, they didn't manage with that. They didn't manage anything comparable. Uh, and we've got this, I wouldn't call it red meat. I'd call it rather plain fare uh, of saying that we will have a freeze in the licence fee. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, by the way, the BBC is a particularly good one to run on on that. Actually, the BBC has, um, unlike, say, the American media, has, has, has a lot of discontents from both political sides but has still got a significant amount of trust in the country, including among some or many Conservative uh, 
voters. So I'm, I'm not sure that's the best one to go on. But yes, other red meat issues include, of course, immigration. Boris Johnson's now going to have to pretend that he's going to do something about an issue he hasn't done anything about for the last two years or more. Um, he's going to have to talk tough on an issue which he'd hoped, clearly, as I said in the magazine once before, uh, he'd hoped would sort of slide by beneath the radar. Boris Johnson's hope was that hundreds and in the end more than a thousand people coming illegally across the channel every day uh, was just not going to be of significant enough interest to detain the attentions of the British people. He was wrong on that, uh, uh, but he still hasn't developed a policy. But we already see this week, again, a little bit of Operation Red Meat, perhaps, uh, talk of sending in uh, the military to deal with the situation in the Channel, uh, sending in the Royal Navy, the Army, perhaps the RAF in due course. Uh, I can't help smiling about this, of course, because... It's so incredibly transparent. Uh, it's the sort of tough talk that some conservatives like to engage in, in the hope that it'll almost sexually thrill their voters. And of course, actually, it, it, it doesn't. I think the conservative voters are not uh, what Boris Johnson thinks they are. I, I, I think they are, as I think he's making the same mistakes as I say in the column that Theresa May made, uh, which is when she got that rather disconcerting sense of disconnect from the voter base suddenly makes a presumption that the Conservative voter base is both ugly and stupid. Yep. And I think they're neither. Um, but uh, Boris Johnson is going the same route. It's a great mistake. You haven't always had such criticism for the Prime Minister. You once wrote that he was the only politician of his generation who can make people feel good. What do you think's changed? Uh, yeah, I, I, I stick by that. I, I, I've always maintained that uh, that he has qualities that are almost un unheard of in his generation, I, I, certainly unparalleled in his generation. Uh, it used to be the case, again, you might say the referendum took some of this out of, out of it, but uh, it used to be the case that if you mentioned Boris's name in the country, first of all, first name terms like Kylie, like Madonna, like other sort of celebrities, uh, Boris always. If you said Boris's name to people, they say, ah, oh, Boris. There is a sort of um, lifting of the spirits, a sense of holiday. As I've said before, nobody ever said, ah, oh, Teresa. Um, no one ever said, ah, oh, John, good old John Major. Um, it never happened. The point is, is, is that Boris had an unusual quality in politics. But, as I mentioned in this week's column, that seems to have faded. I'm reminded of the case of Michael Barrymore after the body was found in his pool. It wasn't that Michael Barrymore's talent disappeared. It wasn't that we didn't still remember that he was a man capable of making us laugh. It's just that the laughter died. And something similar has happened in recent weeks and days with Boris Johnson. It's the period in which the laughter has died. We know that he was once able to entertain, but the question remains over whether he can govern. And some people would say that the answer to that question is now in. Well, I'm curious as to what you would say, Douglas. I think it's quite clear that you are disappointed with where his premiership has taken the country so far. Um, I think it's a damning but very revealing point that you make that the laughter has died. And, and once the laughter dies, you know, that's when you know things are really very grim. Do you think it's time that he threw in the towel? Well, um, it's very interesting watching the uh, stunt, which is the best way to put it, of what David Davis did at Prime Minister's Questions this week. A very striking thing to do uh, of actually calling for the Prime Minister's resignation in the House of Commons on his own benches. Uh, uh, some people would say, well, that's David Davis being David Davis. Um, however, it's, it's a serious uh, advance, really, in the movement of dissatisfaction within the Conservative Party. Here, here's the thing that will keep, keep Boris Johnson in place for the time being. It simply isn't clear that there is any obvious successor now. Members of the Conservative Party and others who I speak to say to me, well, Douglas, it was the same before. Nobody ever arrived in office fully formed. You know, even, even uh, the greats like Margaret Thatcher didn't arrive into office fully formed as Margaret Thatcher. So you always take a bit of a risk on it, as it were, with a leader. Here's the problem, though. It's very hard to see 
uh, how the Conservatives could, first of all, engage in a leadership battle at this stage. If they're going to do it, they should do it soon, by the way. I mean, there's no point in doing this, say, a year before the election. Um, so the first, but the first thing is that in any case, is the country really up for another Conservative Party leadership contest? You know, there is this pretense that the Conservative Party is this brutally efficient machine, but anyone who's seen it up close knows that it's much more like a sausage-making factory. You really don't want to see how it works up close. And the second thing is, of course, is there a successor? And I would say at the moment that the answer to that is very clearly no. There is no obvious successor to Boris Johnson. Uh, There are many impressive people uh, around him and indeed on his benches, I would say. Uh, The Conservative Party has a a significant amount of talent, including talent from recent intakes. Uh, It's a very striking contrast with the Labour Party, where effectively, if you go below the, the level of Keir Starmer, you get to just um, uh, an extraordinary uh, array of people, some of whom you, you can't believe are allowed out in public, let alone into the House of Commons. Uh, so, but it's, it's a different level of talent on the Conservative benches. They have got very significant, um, talented figures. However, are any of them yet in a position, first of all, to take over the reins of the most important office in the land? And secondly, to either keep or grow that important electoral advance that Boris Johnson did make in 2019. Uh, Can anyone honestly say that Rishi Sunak, for instance, um, is going to satisfy uh, crucial voters in the Red Wall? I'm not sure about that. Um, Are any of the other contenders? None of them spring to mind. So I think for the time being, it's likely that Johnson will hold on simply because it's not clear what the alternative is. There is no king or queen over the water. There is no person absolutely ready to step forward. But, as I say, that doesn't rule out the possibility that there there might be a challenge. Because, of course, never forget that there's an important rule in politics, which is only one thing unites every single member of the House of Commons. And that is the belief, misguided though it almost always is, that at some point history will call and it will be them. Douglas, while I have you here, let me ask you one more question. Going past Boris Johnson and his two and a half years in office and looking more generally at the Conservative Party, what do you make of their now 11 years in power? Somehow they've had control that long and yet we've ended up with the biggest tax burden in 71 years. Yes, um, there's really only one selling point that Conservatives have after 11 years of Conservative majority government. And that is this. They haven't been Labour. And that's it. That's almost the sum total of their abilities and their boasts to date. Now, of course, we had the five years of the coalition government and David Cameron could always say, well... We had this ball and chain around our ankles called the Liberal Democrat Party, specifically Nick Clegg. That is a significant ball and chain to have to suffer along with as you shuffle through the business of government. But then there was a period in which David Cameron did have a majority. There was a period where Theresa May had a majority. She, of course, blew a majority, but we still had a Conservative majority government. We now have a situation with Boris Johnson for, as I say, over two years, where we have not just an 80-seat Tory majority, but also a crisis that he could have used. And at the end of that crisis and that 80-seat majority, as I say in the column, and as you well know, uh, the question is, have we been governed by Conservatives? And the answer really is no. We've been governed by not Labour. We've been governed by not Corbyn. We have historic levels of public borrowing. We have tax rises. National insurance rises with the old trick, the old Gordon Brown trick of pretending that a national insurance rise isn't really a tax rise. All of the things we've seen many times before. And what is the one flagship policy of this government? COP26. The promise that if we try hard enough, we won't have any electricity by the end of the decade. Uh, The promise that our, our electricity bills, our fuel bills are all going to keep rising, all to get to an uns- unsustainable, impossible goal. Uh, 
But, so the, the one thing that we have really got in policy terms from Boris Johnson in his prime ministership so far is greenery. Uh, a, a sort of particularly, in my form, ridiculous form of greenery. As I say in my column this week, we voted Conservative as a country in 2019 and we got the member for Brighton Pavilion. That is, of course, Caroline Lucas. Um, so uh, that's the, the problem. Uh, the Conservative voter base will feel, as they often do, completely let down by a Conservative government. Conservative governments are masters at letting down their own publics, their own voters. But, as I say, we'll end up always with this question, who else? And I would expect, by the way, as I mentioned in the column, that Operation Red Meat will also include a significant dollop of you thought Jeremy Corbyn was bad, wait till you see what Comrade Keir Starmer would do if he was in office. I'm not sure that that's a threat, that the natural voter base of the Conservative Party let alone the wider country, is going to be all that terrified about in due course. Well, there you have it, viewers. Douglas Murray's take on the not Labour Party. Douglas, as always, thanks for joining us. It's a great pleasure. And now to COVID. The government has announced that it's scrapping Plan B restrictions because it looks like Omicron is receding. Models used by the government in December showed that we could be seeing around 2,500 deaths a day at this point. The actual figure is closer to 200. Why is there such a disparity? Michael Simmons, The Spectator's data journalist, joins us now to talk about the latest COVID figures. Michael, thanks for joining us on Spectator TV. So what's the latest on the COVID data? Thanks for having me on, Kate. Well, what we've seen uh, this week, uh, the really important kind of data that's out this week is the case numbers. And we're seeing something that was originally a trend in South Africa and then appeared to be a trend in London. And now it seems to be a trend in the UK as a whole is that cases are falling almost as quickly as they initially rose. Hmm. And some people are saying that this is just because people are testing less. If you get a positive test on a lateral flow, for example, you might not go and report it online. And now you're not actually asked to take a PCR either. Yep. Yeah, well, there's certainly um, reports of this, as you say, that um, and Sage have spoke about this as well, that there might be different factors affecting the test numbers. Uh, as you say, you no longer going to need to confirm a lateral flow test with a PCR test. Uh, so might it just be that cases are not actually falling, it's just that less people are testing. But actually yesterday we had really crucial data out from the Office of National Statistics um, and they released the uh, Coronavirus Infection Survey, which is really the gold standard of measuring um, infection numbers and true case numbers. And that showed um, in England and also in all other parts of the UK, the Omicron seemed to peak just at the beginning of January. So it does look like the fall in cases is real and we are seeing that across the country. Really interesting stuff. But of course, cases are not the most important data point. It's hospitalizations and deaths that we most crucially have to track. So what are the metrics looking like there? So um, early on um, in December, uh, SAGE were warning um, that uh, there was potential to see between 600 and 6,000 deaths a day around this time. Um, and that was backed up by modelling from Warwick where they looked at different scenarios for the severity um, of Omicron compared to Delta. And those scenarios were for 10%, 20%, 50% and 100%, in other words, as severe as Delta. Um, and we can see when we um, plot the actual daily deaths, they're nowhere near even the lowest scenario, the 10% scenario, which said by now we should be seeing a peak of deaths at around 600 a day. But in reality, we're in the sort of low 200s. And it's also important to say that those um, deaths numbers um, are actually probably a bit inflated because of the amount of incidental COVID cases we have. So a lot of those deaths will be people who ha uh, have had COVID when they died, but they didn't necessarily die of COVID. Um, Michael, let me just pick you up on that last point, because if we go back a year and a half into this pandemic, there was a great debate about whether or not people were in hospital or sadly dying with COVID or of COVID. But that gap was quite small. If in April 2020 you were in hospital with COVID, you were very likely suffering from COVID. Omicron seems to have really changed that dynamic, hasn't it? I know you've been following figures in London for people who are testing positive for COVID in, in, in hospitals in London, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're very sick with the virus anymore, does it? 
Yeah, absolutely. So again, this was something that was seen in early South African data. And then as Omicron was seeded in London, we saw it in London as well, which is that the incidental hospital cases, so people who are in COVID for being prim primarily treated, sorry, for people who are in hospital being primarily treated for something other than COVID that happened to have COVID, that number was kind of flat until Omicron came along. And now that proportion has really just shot up. Um, and we had data out this morning that showed in London, it's now as high as 60%. And in England as a whole, it's reached 48%, which is the highest it's ever been. Wow. Finally, Michael, you wrote a piece last week about how the actual data compared to the modeling that the government was using. How do the models from December and the actual data compare? Uh, yeah, so um, I spoke earlier about the, uh, the deaths modeling um, from Warwick. We also have hospitalization um, models from Warwick. And again, it's those four scenarios um, for different severity, 10%, 20%, 50%, and 100%. Um, and if we plot the actual hospitalizations against those scenarios, the only one that's really tracking close to um, reality is the 10% scenario. But that leaves questions about um, how these models were derived because I, no one has really ever suggested that Omicron is only 10% as severe as Delta. And indeed, the latest estimates from the UK Health Security Agency suggest it's m more likely around 50%. Yes, they've been using that 50% mark, and if you look at that 50%, you know, the, the, the modeling's off the scale compared to the real world data, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Michael, thanks so much for joining me. What is SPYM and how does it come up with its models? I'm joined now by Dr. Ellen Brooks Pollock, an infectious disease modeler from the University of Bristol, who sits on the SPYM group, which advises the government. Dr. Brooks Pollock, thank you so much for joining us on Spectator TV. To start, can you tell us about the modeling group that advises the government? What exactly does it do? Yeah, so it's called it's called SPYM, which stands for the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Group um, on Modeling. And it's a subgroup of SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. And it deals specifically with infectious disease modeling. So there's a few different aspects to that. Some of it is um, scenario modeling, other other parts of it is um, trying to say what's going on with the pandemic at the moment. Uh, for example, estimating important epidemiological parameters like maybe the mortality rate, the transmission rate. Um, and other parts are kind of specific questions maybe tailored to, for example, care homes or schools. So um, kind of targeted, targeted modelling. Hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about this and, and maybe walk us through the COVID modeling process? What are you looking at specifically when you're trying to model how a virus will behave in the future? Yeah, so um, an infectious disease model is basically a mathematical description of how disease spreads in a population. And at the core of all these epidemic models is the transmission of infection between individuals. So that could be really simple. I could have an infectious disease model with two people in it, say me and you. And um, it, for example, if there's a one in six chance that I'll pass it on to you, pass an infection on to you if I'm infected, I could then run this model lots of times and then come up with um, the number of times that you get infected and the number of times that you don't get infected. Um, and so that that would be a perfectly reasonable infectious disease model. But of, um, and basically the models that we use are based on that kind of models, apart from they don't just involve two people, they involve everyone in the country. And we include lots of other complexities like di different rates of contact between children and adults, different rates of uh, symptomatic infection, different rates of severe disease, um, lots of other factors that might be important in COVID transmission, but really at its core, it's this transmission between, between two individuals. And how do you decide what to input into those models? Who makes those calls? Well, I mean, infectious disease modelling as a, as a branch of mathematics has been around now since um, well, for decades, but um, it really kind of came into its own in the 1980s um, with HIV and AIDS. And so a lot of the theory that we've been, that we work with has been developed over, over many years. 
in terms of what's important and what's not important for a particular disease, that really comes from data as much as possible. Um, so, for example, for COVID, it's obviously um, important that we included asymptomatic transmission, so transmission from people who didn't have symptoms. And so uh, what you try and do with your models is include as much data as possible. And where you don't have data, you try and be as agnostic as possible so you don't assign a, um, a probability of associated with that particular thing. There's an infinite amount of modeling that one could do for something like COVID. So how do you decide how to narrow that down and who ultimately is, is making the call about what you are going to model? Well, so that's really um, <clears throat> a mixture of different, a different, a mixture of different processes. Um, so there's some policy asks, so, um, there's some decision making that needs to be done. Then the SAGE and the SPIM Secretariat, they transform policy asks into a question that can be modelled, that can be answered with modelling. Um, and so there's that's one route. Another route is... Um, when you say, sorry, just to clarify, when, when, when you say, sorry. sorry, just to clarify, when you yeah. say policy asks, you mean officials in Whitehall want certain questions answered and they put them to spy M and the SAGE groups. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, the other route is through working with clinicians and working with public health officials and um, just uh, kind of the other general general routes through the scientific discourse other questions come up and we work on those because they because we consider them important or somebody considers them important so it's a combination of <clears throat> policy asks and big scientific questions um, which are communicated within the scientific community in general. Does SAGE, um, SAGE acts independently from government, and yet there's, as we've just been discussing, a lot of overlap between the requests and what's being returned. Does SAGE ever get requests about being asked to input something or model something and actually think to themselves, that's not the right question to be asking, that doesn't quite add up, that's too optimistic, that's too pessimistic, we don't feel like we're being asked for a whole range of answers here. And then might they take it upon themselves to model it anyway? Or are you only responding to the requests of officials or clinicians or public health officials? No, so absolutely the, um, the modelling is that's done is a combination of, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the secretariat, they translate things into modelling questions. And sometimes that's an iterative process. Absolutely, things get changed. Um, and then... Um, the kind of researcher or scientist driven questions um, they come forward as well and I mean one thing that's really important is there's not just one model and one group of modelers that are responding to these questions um, I mean SPIM consists of about 50 infectious disease modelers and um, I, I don't know maybe 10 different uh, institutions and so often people have different approaches and have asked different questions and taken done things in a different way and so that plurality of opinion is really important for making sure that we don't end up just with one answer to one question. At The Spectator we've published some criticism of the modelling saying that it's often been too pessimistic. I think you've actually responded to some of that. Do you think that's an unfair assessment? Well, so models themselves are not opt are not pessimistic or optimistic. They're often designed to do a particular thing, and the models that make the headlines are, are really just a very very small sample of the models that are discussed at SPIM and in, and in other forums. Um, I mean, as you can imagine, it things get complex very quickly as soon as you start incorporating different probabilities and different. Uh, different aspects of people's behavior and so actually it's it's almost impossible or very difficult to predetermine what the output would be so you put in everything you think you believe to be correct and the data that you believe to be correct and you don't really have any say in what what the output is mm. um uh, i mean there even though there as i mentioned there have been many models that have been developed during the pandemic 
Um, and they certainly haven't only contributed to um, evidence supporting increased restrictions. Um, models also, for example, uh, contributed to the evidence that supported the introduction of support bubbles where single person households could join with other households during the lockdown. They also contributed to uh, evidence behind schools reopening um, and lifting of restrictions as well. But um, yeah, they tend, tend, like, tend not to be as headline grabbing, but um, absolutely models have gone in both ways. That's an important point about the headlines, which I want to come back to. Um, but first, I think we, we saw the, the clinch point of this last month when the SAGE scenarios that were published, published showed that deaths by now would be anything between 500 to 5,000 a day. The actual figures look closer to 200, and even this is potentially overstated due to the rise in patients who have had COVID and then sadly died from other ailments. I absolutely take the point that models are not meant to be predictions, but surely given the expertise and the brain power behind the models, they should somewhat line up with real world outcomes. Otherwise, how can you make the case for them? I mean, uh, some of the models um, did, uh, actually un under predicted total numbers, of, uh, total numbers of deaths by this point. So it's absolutely not true that they all uh, were an overestimate. They are, they are, yes. In fact, I think they're on the Spectator website as well. If you um, select, but I mean, it's all about how severe um, how severe Omicron is compared to Delta, and when these when these models were done, uh, it was just, it was very unclear from the data what it was, and so a variety of scenarios were looked at, um, and it it's obviously excellent news that we're on the lower end of those of those numbers because looking at the spectator data hub right now in terms of hospitalization beds occupied and deaths the actual outcome is far far below anything that was released by the sage models in december i think to your point about headlines as well it, it gives the false sense perhaps that these are predictions, but then of course, this, the fact that they're presented as predictions heavily influences public policy. Well, I mean, policy, uh, so th the data that goes into these models changes all the time. So looking at a fixed point in time of when they were done in December isn't necessarily reflective of what they were. I can absolutely send you um, links of models where things were underpredicted as well. They're, they're, um, I don't know I'm where sure you're looking quite the spectator oh, website. No, no, I'm, I'm sure throughout the pandemic there, there have been those moments, but I think that December, uh, those December SAGE models compared to what actually happened and the real world data we were seeing from South Africa is what has brought this whole question of modeling finally to the forefront. Um, the fact that the, not predictions, but the models were, were so um, more extreme than what we actually experienced. Um, and I guess, I guess my broader point here is, even if we accept that these aren't predictions, if, this is, if these models are presented in the way that they are, um, showing you know, potentially catastrophic hospitalization and death figures, really tragic stuff, and it doesn't end up anywhere near that level, doesn't that undermine the trust that we hopefully would have in bodies like SAGE and SPY-M to be able to model this, not just for COVID, but for future pandemics? Uh, I mean, I still, I still dispute the fact that the models in December were all overestimating numbers of deaths because they absolutely weren't. But I agree with you, some of them were. Um, it's key, it's, it's clear that, um, uh, I mean, some of our modelling that in December had much, much lower numbers, for example. Uh, so I, I know it's true because we did it. Um, but so it's it's obviously clear that communication is really key. I mean, most of the time we spend modelling and so we don't really have a lot of time to work on communication and to how, how really to use the to use the numbers and use the curves that come out. Uh, I'm absolutely not saying that all models are right. I don't think that at all. What I think is that they're a tool for understanding um, for understanding the data that we're seeing and for understanding how things might interact. And often it's looking at um, 
even if you're not looking at the absolute numbers, you're looking at the relative impact of different interventions and in different interventions at different times. And they're often quite robust to absolute levels, levels of infection. So it's really a question of how these models are used. Um, I mean, um, well, let me let me to, um, yeah, to, yeah. To, to wrap up. Let me let me ask you a question about your experience on SPIM throughout the COVID pandemic. If we're thinking in the future to to other pandemics, a, a horrifying thought, but one I think is very much on people's minds now, seeing as what we've been through over the past two years, something we have to prepare for. What do you think SPIM and Sage really got right, and what would you do differently if another pandemic were to emerge? Um, well, I, I mean, the way SPIM and SAGE has functioned has changed over the last two years as well. Uh, for example, it's considerably larger than it used to be. And in, in my opinion, having that plurality of models, having that uncertainty is, is really important. And I think for a future pandemic, uh, we'd want to start with that that those plurality of models so we're not just relying on one or two models to to provide evidence for policy um i think the question of communication and how documents are written often the documents we write are quite technical and not intended for public uh, communication and that could i think that could be definitely something that would be improved Mm, certainly Well, thank you so much for joining Spectre TV. This has been a fascinating conversation. And finally, is drinking in the office really all that bad? Can it actually help to bring a team together? I'm joined now by Rory Sutherland, the Spectator's Wikiman columnist. Rory, thank you for joining Spectator TV. Now, in your column for the magazine this week, you have discussed uh, workplace drinking, a topical subject at the moment. Are you for or against? I suppose I'm not necessarily comfortable with what went on in Downing Street by any means, but I'm not quite comfortable either with the way in which it's reported, as though any consumption of alcohol in the workplace necessarily means that there's a party going on and that it's somehow an egregious activity. And the reason I'd say that in particular is much of this reporting, most of it in fact, is being done by journalists who are hardly completely innocent on the question of workplace drinking themselves. And all I can say is it's complicated. I would like a more forensic investigation of what went on. I would regard music, dancing, that kind of party thing as wholly unacceptable, not necessarily because it's illegal, but because it's in bad faith. On the other hand, I don't regard it as acceptable if you take that photograph of the Downing Street garden taken from an upper window. I don't regard that as having any evidential value whatsoever. It shows some people in a garden. The purpose of the legislation was to prevent people mixing with strangers. Those people were not strangers to each other. They were in a secure space. They'd chosen to go outside, which in uh, terms of epidemiological behaviour was probably a sensible thing to do. And one or two of them were consuming wine. Now, I don't quite think it's fair Uh, for that to be used to rile the populace. I accept the fact that 90% of people are rarely, if ever, allowed to drink in the workplace. On the other hand, there are plenty of cultures, including, by the way, medicine, where quite a lot of valuable information transmission takes place by people drinking together after work. In businesses where you're not paid overtime, there's a kind of informal exchange where You stay a little bit late, you do some work, you talk about work, you enjoy a drink. Now, the culture will vary, just as drinking culture varies massively from country to country. I mean, the last two or three presidents of the United States have been teetotal, for example. Okay, it varies enormously from one workplace to another. Yes, I'm completely open to the argument that political culture is far too boozy. I work in advertising and I think the same thing myself. I think it's obsessively gregarious, dominated by kind of FOMO and absolutely obsessed uh, with attending endless drinks parties. I don't think that's healthy. At the same time, I don't think it's entirely fair to vilify the behaviour completely. For one thing, people working very, very hard at conditions of some personal risk 
are entitled to wind down briefly from time to time. Isn't the explosive issue here that we were not under normal conditions? In fact, the police were being sent after people who were daring to have somebody into their garden, have somebody into their home, even have somebody into their office that wasn't a necessary work event. It isn't the issue that some people in number 10 decided to have some wine at the end of the day. It's that they explicitly made it against the rules for anybody else to do so. Uh, the reason, I mean, this, this comes down to an interesting thing, which is to what extent you practice deontology and to what extent you practice consequentialism. OK, now, the reason parties were banned was not because they uh, allowed for the consumption of alcohol. Nothing about the legislation said anything about what you did in your own home. You could be completely sozzled the entire time under lockdown if conditions allowed. The purpose for banning well, parties, probably in by particular yourself garden parties, if you were living on was your that own. it led to mixing. OK, now, if these people are already mixing, they're in a household. If you had spent a lockdown living alone, undoubtedly those conditions were much, much tougher on you than if you lived in an ashram or a commune. I wouldn't be surprised to hear that, for example, the staff of Windsor Castle or the staff of Buckingham Palace had drinks together during lockdown because they occupied the same space. OK, the purpose of the law was not to prevent people having as good a time as was feasibly possible under the circumstances. It was to prevent people becoming exposed to additional people other than those to whom they necessarily had to be in contact with. And so I think there's something we have the rule of law for a reason. Um, and you might argue that the conditions in a workplace, once you have determined that these people have to interact in an office. OK effectively mean that it isn't relevant to prevent people drinking wine with people with whom they're already communing. Now, I, I, OK, I get the fact that it seems unfair, but then so much of this was monstrously unfair. It, it's not just that it was a bit unfair or a bit annoying or a bit lonely or a bit sad that people had to basically stay inside and not see other people. I, I don't remember the guidance coming out from number 10 saying, actually, it's fine if you go out into the park with a bunch of your friends or a bunch of your family and socialize, because we know from a health and safety perspective now that this virus doesn't really transmit outside. In fact, that weekend, they had the police tweeting out, do not break the rules, essentially do not enjoy the good weather with your mates, make sure that you abide by the law. And this isn't an issue of drinking, it's not an issue of having a bit of fun, which I agree, Rory, can be a great time, of course, under the appropriate circumstances. It's the fact that the people who were making these laws have been found to have been breaking them. And they didn't update the laws for everybody else, so it wasn't as if people could enjoy these good times as well. Um, well, other people couldn't enjoy the fact if it involved meeting other people, although on the very same day the beaches were fairly crowded, let's be honest, OK? It wasn't as if the public were being entirely uh, obedient out of doors. I've already written a piece in The Spectator which explained why garden parties had to be banned even when it was known that outdoor transmission was comparatively rare, which is the simple fact that an outdoor garden party turns into an indoor party. That's what tends to happen towards the end of the evening when it gets cold, when people need to leave the loo. In this case, if these people were not meeting anybody new, if they'd invited people from adjacent buildings, absolutely clear. That's an absolutely clear breach of the rules. Here, it's a little more ambiguous. The second question to ask is not necessarily about whether it's good or bad, but whether this deserves the volume of media attention that it's getting. And it strikes me to some extent that we don't actually need the metaverse because the media already creates it for us. A kind of parallel reality where attention is paid to things to the extent to which it suits a preordained narrative. And I don't think the record, by the way, of journalism here is all that great. Robert Cialdini does a lot of work which shows that most media bias is not the result of a biased depiction of opinions, it's the relative prominence that is given to different stories. That's the greater vehicle of media bias, OK? Now, you can imagine a world in which a Blair regime or another regime to whom journalists were better disposed had committed the same infractions where this would have received much less attention and would have ended up on page five. OK? I don't think this is an area which necessarily uh, 
should be dominating the news cycle when you have, you know, a potential invasion of Ukraine on the cards. OK, and there's something about the incessant attention given to the story, which doesn't seem to me entirely in proportion to the infractions committed. Well, Rory, after that discussion, I think you've earned yourself a drink. Thanks for joining Spectator TV. And that's it for this week. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to The Spectator's YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. Thanks for watching and do join us again next week. Thank you.